Well, hey, listen, today we are in the final message of season six of Binge the Bible. We are closing out the Old Testament. If you happen to have your Bibles or you got your phone with you, I'm going to give you two uh, two places in the Bible for you to find and just put your finger there, put your little ribbon there. We're going to be in Luke chapter 2 and Daniel chapter 2. So find Luke, put a, put a marker there, then go to Daniel chapter 2. And if you're thinking, wait a second, I thought we wrapped up the Old Testament last week, you would be correct. I'm going to test you real quick. So last week we closed out with the last book in the Old Testament and it is the book of Malachi, great, great, yes, you were paying attention, awesome. So, if you're wondering, well, why are we still in the Old Testament? Because there's a period of time that we're going to talk about between Malachi and Matthew. We're going to bridge that gap today. So before I get into that, though, I want to take you back through a crash course on the Old Testament. So, we've been working off of this timeline here, and the timeline begins at creation. We know in the beginning, God created the heavens, the earth, everything that we see, And then we stopped at 2000 BC where we met Father Abraham. This is when God makes a covenant with man and he says, I'm going to be your God, you're going to be my people. Abraham, at this time, his name was Abram, and God says, Abram, you and your wife are going to leave everything you know, you're going to set out to a place that you've never been, you're going to trust me, follow me, and I'm going to make you the father of many nations. That sounds awesome, except you realize Abraham is quite old, and he has no kids. His wife is barren. This seems impossible, but how many of you know what is impossible with man is possible with God? God delivers on his promise, and out of Abraham, a nation is born. God's chosen people, the Hebrew people, the Jewish people, the Israelites, they're God's chosen people, and as we watch their journey unfold, unfortunately, we see them develop as a nation, but they're not a free nation, and they're not living in a promised land, and they're not experiencing prosperity, because around 1500 BC, they're living in Egypt, they're living under the oppression of Pharaoh, they're crying out to God, literally, it's so bad that Pharaoh has said, every Hebrew boy that's born must be thrown into the Nile. You must kill him. Literally, you must end the life of every Hebrew boy. Why? Because the Hebrews were growing. And the more they were oppressed, the more they grew. And Pharaoh and Egypt are like, we got to slow them down because if they keep growing, they'll overpower us. So life was miserable. It was terrible. They cry out to God, God, save us. And God says, I will. And I'm going to raise up a deliverer whose name is Moses. And Moses ends up being the mouthpiece for God. He goes before Pharaoh, let my people go. And over and over, Pharaoh says no. And God sends these 10 plagues on Pharaoh and the people of Egypt. And finally, God says, all right, I'm going to let you, or or Pharaoh says, I'm going to let you go. And he releases them. Of course, what happens when he releases them? He's like, wait a minute, who's going to build all our stuff now? We lost our labor, so he sends his army after them. Moses and all the people are leaving Egypt. They, they get to the Red Sea, and they're like, what do we do now? And God says, you know, raise up your staff, and when he does, the water parts. Crazy miracle. I mean, let's just be honest. If there, there's moments in the Bible that you're like, I would have loved to have seen that. How awesome. Could you imagine if I took you down to Carolina Beach, and I was like, check this out. Watch this. Like, you just want to be there for that. So he, he raised up his staff, the water parts, the Israelites, they pass on dry ground. Pharaoh's army are like, we're going after them. And when they get in, the waters crash over them. They drown, and God delivers his people. It's incredible. Unfortunately, over time, while they occupy this promised land, their disobedience sets in. They quit trusting God. They become comfortable and complacent, and they say, hey, God, we got it from here. And they begin violating the covenant that they had established with God. They start mixing their worship of foreign gods into their worship of the one true God. And God's like, no, we're not having that. And as we fast forward, we discover that they are living as a fallen people. They want a king. And in 1000 BC, the greatest king of all time is put in place. And this is David. David's known after a man. He's known as a man after God's own heart. What a great thing to be known for. 
Now, we know David's far from perfect. We know him as the shepherd boy, youngest of all of his brothers, who is anointed king. Has to be a cool moment if you're a younger brother, and in front of all your brothers, you're anointed to be the next king. You got to imagine, he looked at his brothers, and he was like, y'all see this? Told you you better respect me. Put some respect on my name. I imagine that's what... David is saying, unfortunately, you know, if you're the shepherd boy and you're anointed king, you don't immediately become king. You actually got to go back to the pasture and you got to take care of your sheep. But God used the pasture to prepare him for the palace. The lessons he learned in the pasture were able to allow him to lead people that were very much like sheep. You know, the Bible describes you and I, it it calls us sheep. And you know something about sheep is that um, they're dumb. I'm not saying you're dumb, but we all know dumb people, right? Say amen if you agree with me. Yeah, we all do. We wander from where we're supposed to be, and David's got to lead a wandering people, and God uses him in a great way. And as we move forward to 500 BC, we find that God's people have yet again turned their back on God and ignored him. And God says, Because of that, I'm going to raise up another nation known as the Babylonians. And the Hebrews are like, not the Babylonians, they're they're worse than we are. And God's like, I know, and I've got a plan. And so we've been living in this period around 500 B.C. When we looked at Malachi, we were into the 400s, and we left off last week telling you that there's this 400-year gap from Malachi to Matthew, to where we have the birth of Jesus. It's known as the 400 silent years. Why is it called that? It's because there's no recorded word from God. There's no active prophets. We find ourselves going, God, what's going on? I mean, have you ever been in a place where you were crying out to God, calling out to him, and it just seemed like he was absent? It's like, why aren't you answering me? You mad, bro? What's up? You playing the the quiet game, the silent game? You're really good at it, okay? You win. What happened during those years, this 400-year period, it's called the intertestamental period. And the question is, what happened during those years? I had a friend of mine sent me a text. It was a great question. He said this. He said, if God took a break from us for 400 years, what did the people do in that time? How did they maintain faith? And my answer was, God didn't so much take a break from us as much as he gave us what we wanted. We had been living like he didn't exist. We had been ignoring him, and God's like, if that's what you want. And how many know God loves you enough that he will let you wander from him and ignore him and run to some pretty rough places, because it's usually in those places that he gets our attention. What I need you to know is this silence does not mean absence, nor does it mean inactivity. You know, one of the songs that we sing from time to time here at LifePoint is this song called Waymaker. You're probably familiar with it. The lyrics say something like this. They say, Waymaker, miracle worker, promise keeper, light in the darkness, that is who you are. And then it says this even when I can't see it, you're working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. You never stop. You never stop working. You familiar with this song? These 400 years are a reminder that when we can't see God working, He's still working. When we can't feel God working, He's still working. And the best way I can describe this 400 years is the idea that God is like this grand master at chess, and he's moving the pieces on the chessboard right where he wants them. He knows what's happening. He's got his next moves figured out. They say this, I I don't know thing one about chess. Years ago, I was like, I'm going to learn chess, and our executive pastor, Daryl Strickland, bought me a chess board, and I still don't even know what all the pieces are and how they're supposed to move. So I don't know much about chess, so I I, I research this, and they say that people that achieve grandmaster level in chess can think 15 to 20 moves ahead of the one they're about to make. My brain ain't built like that. So bottom line, we're playing checkers, and God's up there playing chess, and things don't make sense to us because they're not supposed to. The Bible tells us in Isaiah 55, verse 8 and 9, for my thoughts, this is God, My thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways. And my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. Bottom line, when we think we have God figured out, we're not even scratching the surface of God. And so we look at things that are like, why did you do that, God? And God's going, just watch. Just watch. I I, I know what I'm doing 
So during this 400 years, what happens, and we're going to look at this, is we see kingdoms rise and kingdoms fall. And it's as if God is positioning the pieces just where he wants them. So my goal today is I want to do this. I'm going to mix a little bit of Bible with a good bit of history. And so if you're here and you're like, well, I'm just not sure that I believe the Bible, awesome. You're going to love this message. Because what I'm going to do is reference a little bit of Scripture, but then I'm going to put it aside. I'm going to talk about what you should have already learned through history classes and history textbooks. So in order to understand what's about to happen and what I'm going to discuss, I want to take you back to 612 B.C., all right? A little bit of a history lesson, so try your best, lean in. I'll make history as exciting as possible. 612 B.C., from 612 to 539 B.C., the ruling power of the day were the Babylonians, the Babylonians. Now, we know that God allowed the Babylonians to rise up in power, to come against Jerusalem, and to exile the people of Jerusalem. This happened in three different waves. You'll see that this happened in 605 B.C., 597 B.C., and then 586. Well, in that 605, that first wave, what happened is the Babylonians came in under the charge of King Nebuchadnezzar, and he said, get the finest, the, the, the richest, the brightest, the best And bring them back to Babylon. And one of the individuals was a 17-year-old named Daniel. You're probably familiar with Daniel and the lion's den. This is the Daniel we're talking about. So Daniel gets taken into captivity in Babylon. And when we get the book of Daniel, we find Daniel, it kind of is is two parts. One, he's writing about the faithfulness of God in his life. But then he's also giving glimpses into the future of what's going to come. And in Daniel chapter 2, we find King King Nebuchadnezzar having this dream. And and here's here's what goes down. If you want to join me, it's page 759 in your LifePoint Bible. In 759, you're going to find this. What's happened is the king has this dream, and he's shook. He can't sleep. He's like, "I, I got to figure out what this dream means. This is crazy. And the king has all these advisors. Some of them are astrologers. Some of them are, they're They're magicians. And so he brings them all in and he says, I need to know what my dream means. And they're like, cool, tell us the dream. He's like, no, no, no. I need you to tell me what I dreamed and then I need you to tell me what that dream means. And they're like, what? How are we supposed to know what you dreamed? I mean, could you imagine just like telling somebody, I I need you to help me figure out what my dream means, but before I tell you the dream, I need you to actually tell me what I dreamed. And they're like, nobody can do this. And the king says, fine, then you know what? I'll have you killed and your family killed. Literally, I'll have you torn limb from limb. That's what King Nebuchadnezzar says. Not exactly the nicest of kings. Daniel says, I'll do it. I'll do it. And if you'll go to page 759, beginning, uh, it's Daniel chapter 2, beginning in verse 36, we see this begin to unfold. It says this, it's uh, bottom of the page, 759. I believe bottom of the page. Yeah, no, sorry. Turn the page. 760. I was wrong. Off by one. This was the dream. This was the dream. And now we will interpret it to the king. Your majesty, you are the king of kings. The God of heaven has given you dominion and power and might and glory in your hands. He's placed all mankind and the beasts of the field and the birds in the sky. Wherever they live, he's made you ruler over them. That sounds, if you're the king, you're like, that's right. That's right. So I am in charge of all of this. I have dominion over all the people and all the animals. And then he says this. He says, you are the head of gold. What's he describing? He's describing a statue that the king saw in his dream. He sees this statue. We'll explain this statue in just a minute. But this statue has a head of gold. And he's like, king, you are the head of gold. And gold is the most valuable thing out there. So the king is thinking, absolutely, this sounds great. Verse 39, after you, another kingdom will arise inferior to yours. Next, a third kingdom, one of bronze, will rule over the whole earth. Finally, there will be a fourth kingdom, strong as iron, for iron breaks and smashes everything. And as iron breaks things to pieces, so it will crush and break all the others. Just as you saw that the feet and toes were partly of baked clay and partly of iron, so this will be a divided kingdom. Yet it will have some of the strength of iron in it, even as you saw it mixed with clay. 
And then if you go down to verse 44, he says, uh, he says, in those times of kings, the God of heaven will set up another kingdom that will never be destroyed, nor will it be left to another people. It will crush all those kingdoms and bring them to an end, but it in itself will endure forever. So here's, let me put a picture on the screen to give you, help you see what I'm talking about. Here's a picture of the statue. So the king's got this dream. He sees this head is gold. It represents Babylon. It's Nebuchadnezzar. He's like, this is great. But under the head is the, the chest and the arms, and it's made out of silver. Now, we're going to learn a little more about this, but this represents the Medes and the Persians. And then under that, the middle and the thigh represents the kingdom of Greece. And then as we work our way down, the legs are made out of iron. This is Rome. The feet and the, are, are made of iron and clay. And it's a divided kingdom. And when we look at this, we're also told that there's yet another kingdom that will be raised up that will destroy and dominate all others, and it's the kingdom of God. And so if I were to take you all the way back to the book of Habakkuk, we learn that God reveals that the Babylonians will come up and that they'll conquer Jerusalem. And Habakkuk is like, why would you use a nation more wicked than us to punish us? And God goes, I got a plan. Remember, he's moving the pieces right where he wants them. And so we saw the Babylonians there as the first dominating world power. But now let's go to the next. So we know it goes from the gold of the Babylonians to the silver. And from 539 to 331, we see the Medes and the Persians step in. So if you're tracking this timeline, we went from the Babylonians to now the Medes and the Persians. Remember, Daniel said... There are going to be other kingdoms that come after you. This is just a vision that he's interpreting. Yet when we track with history, guess what? This vision is coming to pass. 539 to 331, the Medes and the Persians. And in Daniel chapter 11, verse 1, the Bible says this. In the first year of Darius, or Darius, which is the correct pronunciation, but it's just weird to say Darius. In the first year of Darius, the Mede, I, Daniel, took my stand to support and protect him. So Daniel was serving King Nebuchadnezzar, but now that Nebuchadnezzar has fallen, Darius has recruited him to serve in his kingdom. So now he's serving in this Persian kingdom. Now, Darius the Mede took over in 539 B.C. During this time period, God gives Ezra this instruction. He says, I want you to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. See, one of the first things that happened when the Persians took over is they told all the Jews, you can go back home. But unfortunately, over a million Jews had been taken into exile, and now only 50,000 of them go back to Jerusalem. But Ezra, speaking on behalf of God, says, get the temple put back together. We've got to rebuild the temple. And so in 538, they begin to rebuild the temple. They work hard for two years, and then they stop. Why did they quit doing what God called them to do? Because they were afraid. They were afraid of the Persian government. They were afraid of the persecution that was going to come against them. And so God sends Zechariah. We learned about him. Zechariah says, get back to work. Finish building the temple. And so they begin getting back to work, rebuilding the temple. The temple gets built. Problem is the wall around Jerusalem has been torn down. It's been attacked. It's been destroyed. They're vulnerable. And so God sends someone to begin the process of rebuilding the wall. Pop quiz. Who is it that was charged with rebuilding the wall around Jerusalem? Nehemiah. I heard a couple of you say it. Nehemiah. Leland, I know you had that one. You got it right. 445 B.C., Nehemiah rebuilds the wall around Jerusalem, and the Medes and the Persians stay in control until 331 B.C., but that doesn't last. Remember, we go from the Babylonians to the Persians, and now a new power is rising up, and it is the Greeks. From 331 to 143, we see the Greeks begin to rise up. Who's leading the charge here? You've heard of him. His name is Alexander the Great. At the age of 24, Alexander the Great begins to make his way across the known world. And anytime they would conquer a town or, or a city, they had basically, you had two options when they came in. Either you will become Greek or you will die. You can choose. And so it was their goal to turn the entire known world into a Greek world. 
And so they would come in and they would take over and they wanted to make your region a little Greece. And matter of fact, and he was great at this. Let me show you just a quick map of how much of the known world at this time he dominated. This is pretty unbelievable. 24-year-old, 10,000 men just going from place to place, kicking butt, taking names. And so upon conquering these regions, you were expected to learn the Greek language, learn the Greek culture. They have a name for this. It's called Hellenization. You learned about this in school. It's called Hellenization. It's the spreading of Greek ideas and culture. And so Greek culture was big into art and architecture. If you ever go to Greece and you see, I mean, it's, it's amazing to look at. So art, architecture, science, literature, government, philosophy, they were very learned And so everywhere they went, they wanted everyone to have the same language, the same currency, the same values, the same system. In essence, what they're doing is they're trying to create one nationality that is all Greek. And so with the help of 10,000 men, Alexander the Great's kingdom exploded like no other. Now, if you're still in the book of Daniel, go to Daniel chapter 11 with me. Flip a couple pages. And I'll show you something else neat that Daniel predicts. Remember, this is just visions that Daniel is interpreting. And in Daniel chapter 11, verse 3 and 4, he says this. He says, then a mighty king will arise who will rule with great power and do as he pleases. Does that sound like Alexander the Great? He has arisen in power. He's doing as he pleases. Nobody can stand against him. Verse 4, after he has arisen... His empire will be broken up and parceled out towards the four winds of heaven. It will not go to his descendants, nor will it have the power he exercised, because his empire will be uprooted and given to others. Now, interesting, when you start studying history, here's what you find, is that he has no kids to pass his empire off to. So upon his deathbed, he's asked, Who should be responsible for your kingdom? Who do you want to leave it to? And here's his response. He said, let my four generals fight it out. What did did Daniel say? He said that this kingdom's going to arise, but it's not going to last, and it's going to be divided across the four corners, the four winds, the four generals fight it out. And so for the next 40 years, these generals fight for this kingdom, and there's two main generals that really end up controlling the land. The first is Seleucus. Seleucus is responsible for Mesopotamia, Persia, Syria, and Iraq. And then there's Ptolemy. Ptolemy is over northern Africa and Egypt. And so Ptolemy becomes the king of the south, while Seleucus is king of the north. And I just want to show you a quick picture of their kingdoms. And you're going to look at this, and you're going to see, it looks like Seleucus' kingdom is massive, and Ptolemy's just got this tiny little kingdom here. But before you think, like, man, get your act together, Ptolemy, I mean, he's, he's kicking butt, The truth is, Ptolemy had the desired piece of land. Where we see the Ptolemaic kingdom is where we have Israel. Israel has always been a fought over property. It is amazing just how fertile the land is. It backs up to to water. It's desirable. If you look at the Seleucid kingdom, I mean, it's arid. It's uh, it's desert. Nothing grows there. So Seleucus really wants what Ptolemy has. But Ptolemy is there, and he's over this region that, uh, that we find Israel. Now, why does this matter? Okay, Pastor, why, why a history lesson? Because everyone thought God was silent when he was really setting the table for what was to come. See, Seleucia's kingdom, sure, it looked larger, but Ptolemy's had th- this kingdom that, that encompassed fertile ground, water, and, and, and so what happens is that while Ptolemy's kingdom included Israel, you, you find that Ptolemy was a friend of the Jews. He was kind to the Jews. And then you, you find Ptolemy II, his son, is even bigger friend of the Jews. So let me ask you a question. When we read the Old Testament and we see these Jewish people, what was the Old Testament written in? What language was it written in? Hebrew. Yes, they spoke Hebrew. So they, they spoke Hebrew, but many generations have come and gone, and now Hellenization has happened, and everybody's speaking Greek now. The problem is all their scriptures are in Hebrew, and many of them can't read them. So Ptolemy II undertakes this great project to have the first five books, known as the Torah, known as the law, translated from Hebrew 
into Greek. This happened in 280 BC, and we call it the Septuagint. Why is it a big deal? Because Torah was life. Jews memorized the first five books of the Torah. They lived by it. The law was life. It's how they experienced the blessing of God. Why is this important? Why is it important that they get in the Word? Well, you tell me. Because when we get in the Word, the Word does what? It gets in us. So check it out. God is literally using a Greek king to translate the greatest message into the current language. And then if you keep tracking through Greek history, you'll find that 198 B.C., Antiochus III, he comes in and he hates these Jews. He forces Hellenization upon the Jewish people. He despises them. And then following him, 175 B.C., Antiochus Epiphanes, he hates them even more. Here's how much he despises the Jews. He walks into the temple and he sets up a statue of Zeus. Now this is God's temple and he sets up a statue to his God, Zeus, and then he does the unthinkable and he sacrifices a pig in the temple. Now you have to know, God instructed the Jewish people, you have nothing to do with swine, nothing to do with pigs, and he walks right in and he slaughters this pig right there, and we see this referred to as the, desol- the abomination of desolation. We'll see this uh, referenced in, in our Bibles in uh, Daniel 9, as well as in Matthew 24, Jesus talks about this. And it's also a foreshadowing of the temple being destroyed in 70 AD, but we don't really have time to get into that. So sticking with these Greeks for just a moment, 167 to 160, the Maccabean revolt happens, which is where Jewish uprising takes a stand against the Greeks, and they win. They win. They're now allowed to go back and worship in their temple just as God told them. They had full access, full freedom to worship, but it wasn't meant to last. And so 149 to 146, a battle takes place called the Battle of Carthage. If you've ever watched Gladiator, they reference the Battle of Carthage. Great movie. Great movie. I want to go watch that later. So what begins to happen is the Greeks and the Romans begin to have this tension And in 146, we have the Battle of Corinth where Rome wins and takes over, and it leads to the next world power, which is Rome. From 146 to 476 A.D., we're now crossing over from B.C. to A.D., Rome is in power. Several things happen in that window of time. 63 B.C., Pompey captures Jerusalem, and they start setting up all their Roman gods. So, you know, what was home to the Jewish people, the holy city has now got these Roman gods all over it. And now they want to be a a little Rome. They want everybody to be Roman. And in 37 BC, Herod the Great rises up. He's in power. He's a genius. He's he's an architectural genius. He's one of the greatest builders. If you come with me on a trip to Israel, I'll show you some things that Herod the Great built. And Herod the Great says this. He says, I will let you have your temple if you'll just be quiet and pay your taxes. I'll leave you alone. And so he even goes so far as to begin to rebuild the temple for them in 20 B.C. It takes 46 years to finish this temple. And all he wants them to do is be quiet, pay your taxes, and he builds this massive temple. I got a, a picture of Herod's temple. It's unbelievable the size and the scope. Everything he built was massive. It was a flex. He's like, if we're going to do it, we're going to build it big. And then in 20 B.C., we see Caesar Augustus. Caesar Augustus thought he's, he is a god. That's how he saw himself. And he wants to leave his stamp on the world, and he wants to fast-track the Roman Empire. And so he surveys the land, and he has 50,000 miles of roads built all across the landscape. It's crazy. I mean, just trying to get a road built today is a big deal. Imagine 50,000 miles of roads. He made it possible to travel from one place to another easily. Problem, though, is that while doing this, he drained the Roman Empire's bank account. Between the roads, the battles, the water systems, they're they're running out of money. And let me just ask, what does every government do when they need more money? They raise taxes. If you got your Bibles, go with me to page 880, also known as Luke chapter 2. I promise you we're going somewhere. Luke chapter 2. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, says, In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. 
So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem to the town of David because he belonged to the house in the line of David. Wait a second. Hold on. Why is Caesar Augustus putting out a census? Here's why. He needed to know how many people do we have so that I know how much I need to tax them. So everyone must go back to their home ancestral town to be counted so that Eventually, they will need to be taxed. Because you ever read the Christmas story and you're like, come on, why in the world would Joseph put his very obvious pregnant wife on a donkey for a 60 to 70 mile trip? I don't know if you looked at it, but the terrain from, from uh, Nazareth to Bethlehem, it's not an easy terrain. We're talking 60, 70 miles rocky terrain. That's a rough ride. That's a tough journey in your third trimester. Why would he do this? Here's the reason why. Because if he didn't, he'd be put to death. So let me just ask you, could it be that God was working this whole time, these 400 years, setting the stage to get Joseph and Mary to a specific place at a specific time? What if I told you that 700 years before Jesus was born, the prophet Micah predicted all of this? See, if you had time to go to Micah chapter 5, verse 2, you'll find this messianic prophecy that says, But you, Bethlehem, but you, Bethlehem, Ephrathah, though you're small among the clans of Judah, meaning you are a nowhere town, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. Listen, Bethlehem, you are not even a blip on the map, but out of you is going to come a ruler who actually stems from Israel. From, from eternity past, and he's going to become the ruler. Now, you got to admit, that's pretty incredible considering Bethlehem was this tiny place, and Micah wrote this 700 years earlier. So is it beginning to make sense? That while we call him the silent years, God may have been silent, but he was definitely active. He was working, and he was moving. And, and one last thought, if you'll go there in, in your Bibles, Matthew chapter 28. One last thought, and then we'll unpack, give some takeaways, and we'll wrap up season six. In Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, we were just at the beginning of Jesus' life. Let's go to the end of it real quick. Matthew 28, verse 18, says this. Then Jesus came to his disciples. This is after the crucifixion and after the resurrection. He came to them, and here's what he said. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. Let me ask you this question. Why would Jesus give a command to the disciples to change the world if they couldn't get to the ends of the earth? Why would he give them a command to do something that they couldn't do? But they can get there because the Romans have installed 50,000 miles of roads. They literally paved the path for gospel expansion. Think about this. The very Romans who created crucifixion also created the roads that this message, this gospel would travel on. God did that. He orchestrated every bit of this, gave this vision to Daniel, and he executed it over these 400 years. So here's three takeaways. What does this mean to you and I? First one, number one, do not interpret silence as absence. Do not interpret silence and absence Listen, when you can't hear his voice, look for his hand. Look for his hand. God was at work. He's always been working. He's always working. Even when I can't see it, you're working. Even when I can't feel it, you're working. God is and always is at work. Don't mistake silence. So often we're praying for something and we're not hearing. We're not hearing our answers. I want you to know he's still working. He's still speaking. Matter of fact, he's always speaking through his word. It's amazing how often we want an audible word of God when he's given us his word and we've been ignoring it. He speaks through his word. That's why it's important to be in the word. He speaks through other believers. This is why it's important to put ourselves in small groups where we're, we have people that can tell us the truth. So often God will he'll give an insight to somebody that's close to us and they'll speak that word to us. So he speaks through his word. He speaks through other believers. What I found most often is that when people say God is absent, it's really not God that's absent. It's that they've become absent. 
They become absent from his word, absent from his people. This is one of the reasons that, that you find the early church made it a priority to gather together. They made it a point to meet regularly, weekly. They were together. It was, it was the, the beginning of their week. It was the, the centerpiece of their life, gathering together. The book of Hebrews says, don't neglect the assembling of yourselves. I saw a recent study that said that the average person today attends church about 30% of the time. One out of three weeks. Now the good news is that our millennial generation is actually attending church more. The younger generation is ramping it up. They're taking it serious, but our older generation, we're, we're real casual. As long as it's not a nice day, or there's not travel ball, or there's not that competition, or it's not raining, or we get really, really casual. But I'm telling you, you want to hear the voice of God, get to a place where his word is being preached, where you're around people who love you and will speak truth into your life. Don't neglect the meeting of yourself. Stop saying you want to know what God's will is if you don't read his word. The will of God is revealed in the word of God. So he's, you know, he, he may not be audibly talking, but let me tell you, he is talking. Number two, second takeaway is this. Actions speak louder than, finish it for me, words. We all know that's true. So I prefer to interpret this 400 400 years, this intertestamental period, not as the silent years. I don't see it as silence. I see it as preparation. God is preparing. He's setting the table, positioning the pieces on the chessboard right where he wants them. He's moving some people. He's removing others. I like what Henry Blackaby says. He says, watch to see where God is working and join him in his work. You want to experience God? Get involved where God's working. Look for his hand and plug yourself in. And and, and just because you can't hear it doesn't mean he's not working. Look for where he's working and get involved. His actions are evidence that he is not absent. Let me say it again. His actions are evident that he is not absent. Guys, we're seeing God. I think there's a new awakening happening across our nation right now. And we just need to be tuned into it. And as we prioritize his word, I'm telling you, we're going to see him move in a way like never before. And here's the third takeaway. The third is this. God always keeps his word. God always keeps his word. If there was a theme through the entire Old Testament is that God is a promise-keeping God, and we are a promise-breaking people. That's really the the message. God is a promise-keeping God, and we are a promise-breaking people. But can I tell you, God still loves you. Just like we saw in Micah 700 years earlier, God plugged Bethlehem into the GPS for the birth of the Messiah. And he worked through Babylonians and Persians and Greeks and Romans to set the stage for all of that to begin to happen for the promised Messiah. Can I tell you, his promise was good then and his promise is good now. God's patient, he's not in a hurry. He'll let you walk through the consequences of your own doing. He'll allow you to experience the pain of walking away from him and everything that comes with that just to get you to the place where you recognize your need for him. And let's be honest, that's where a lot of us are at and that's where a lot of us meet the Lord. We get to the end of our rope, we hit a place called rock bottom, we look up and we go, God, I'll give you a shot. And God's going, it's about time. I've been waiting because I love you. Can I tell you, wherever you're at today, God loves you. Does it break his heart when you walk away? Absolutely. Does it break his heart when you live like he doesn't exist? Absolutely. But that doesn't cause him to stop loving you. He loves you. And you may be in a period that feels silent, but you need to know he's not absent. He desires you. And he's inviting you home. And so I want to give you this opportunity today. As we close out Binge the Bible Season 6 that we would take a moment and just turn our hearts to the Lord. And today, if you've never said yes to him, maybe across one of our campuses, you've never said yes to the Lord, maybe online, we want to give you that opportunity right now. I want to invite everybody, just for a few moments, would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me? Just in this moment, if you'd be honest, say, Pastor, I don't know that I've ever said yes to the Lord. But I want to know. I want to be confident in this. Can I give you this word? The Bible tells us that when we declare with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. That's a promise of God. And so today, if you've never called on him and you've never made him the Lord and Savior of your life, would this be your moment where you say yes to him and you find grace and forgiveness and healing 
yes, a promised eternity in heaven with God, but you find peace and life here today, purpose today. So if today you need to say yes to the Lord, would this be your moment? I'm going to pray, and I'm going to let you make this your prayer back to the Lord. You can repeat this in the quietness of your heart. You don't need to pray it out loud. But if today you're ready to begin a relationship with God, would you pray this? Say, dear God, thank you for loving me. Just repeat that from your heart to God. Dear God, thank you for loving me. I repent of my sin today, and I give you my life. I put all my trust in Jesus. I declare he's my Lord, and he's my Savior. Change me today. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with strength and courage, purpose, identity. Help me to live for you. Say this. Say, thank you for saving me. What I'd love to do for another 30 seconds with our heads bowed is I want to celebrate with those of you that just joined me in praying that. What I'm going to ask you to do in just a second is raise your hand high in the air. As you raise your hand, I just want to see it. I want to celebrate with you. And so if that's you, in just a moment, when I count to three, would you boldly extend your hand as high as you can? And we want to celebrate together. So with nobody else looking around, if that's you on the count of three, raise your hand high. Ready? One, two, three. Slip it up high saying, that's me. I'm saying yes to Jesus today. Yeah, awesome, awesome. Just for one more moment, yeah. Incredible. I know hands across, uh, across campuses are going up. Those of you online, your host will give you some instructions. Today we celebrate with you. Listen, while your hand is up, one of our team members is going to bring a card, and they're going to put it in your hand. We'd love to ask you to fill that out. We'll give you some instructions in just a moment. If for some reason we don't see your hand, you can grab a card off the seat back in front of you. Your name matters to us, and we want to celebrate with you. Well, let's do this. Let's put our hands down. Church, can we celebrate together?